And now we're left with an option of getting a booster shot to increase the efficacy of the, vac of the vaccine. So do we need an additional dose of vaccine to attain more durable protections? And if so, who needs them? And do we have any clinical trials that can back this up? I have not seen a single piece of data that supports the need for a third dose. I have seen many countries basing their decision for a third dose on data obtained from a country called Israel. And as you know, Israel signed a pact with the company Pfizer. So they are using the Pfizer vaccine to a larger extent in their country. So the data from Israel has become the norm. Number one, Israel only showed that when you look at the level of antibodies in the body after six months for some selected people that they picked randomly, the levels of antibodies went down. But that's normal. And if the enemy is not there after vaccination, your antibody goes down. It's really important to challenge those people with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and show me that they have no protection. So without showing me a challenge data where you took volunteers who are fully vaccinated six months or nine months after the second dose and you challenge them with a low dose of the virus, if they develop the disease, it means they are not protected, then I am convinced that the third dose is needed. Experiments that were done in baboons, so these are monkeys, and these experiments were done exactly what I have described to you. Because we can't do this human challenge experiments in humans, we can afford to do them in baboons. And in baboons, once you treat them with a vaccine and you challenge them, they are protected. To me, from an immunology perspective, from a virology perspective, it's clear. And then I have the pharmaceutical companies who are keeping the, the data about the challenge that was done in animal studies away from us. And they are really pushing the agenda because they're gonna make billions and billions of dollars. And I can assure you, if we accept the third dose and people do the third dose, the fourth dose is coming. You can do an antibody titration test, like for hepatitis B as an example, and if your titration capability is very low, then we give you a booster dose. Uh, this time around, uh, I am not convinced. I haven't seen any data that convinced me. And I think the timing of it is also very wrong because we can't convince people to take the two doses. And now you want to convince somebody to take a third who's refusing to take two. It's never going to work. I think people will just rebel against this. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, the variants of COVID-19. Can you tell us about the COVID-19 variants of concern as of today? And why are we keep hearing about these new variants right now? It's actually a very interesting question. I think, I think last year when we spoke, there were about eight variants circulating. And uh, we saw that some of the variants were not very stable. They were very transient, you know, because they made a, a certain genetic change. They had a certain uh, advantage, uh, but they didn't last very long and they disappeared. And then by December time with all these vaccines, and uh, I think the misinterpretation that was given to, to us, people around the world, around this planet, about vaccines, uh, many countries have opened uh, their doors, you know, they reduced the health barriers, they allowed people to go out, you know, people thought, you know, that's the end, there are no more uh, viruses. And what happened by January, February, March, April time, the world changed with these variants. We end up having about 25 to 30 new variants. And each variant has a scary story associated with it. But for the Delta, its changes were very interesting. It became much more uh, uh, virulent. It became much more uh, 
toxic to the body. You need just a low dose of the virus to develop COVID-19. And at the same time, it was propagating extremely fast through either vaccinated or unvaccinated people, especially that we are getting into the business of antivirals and antivirals and mutations don't go well uh, at all. So the fact that we have stabilized some version of this virus, I think potentially it's going to enable uh, companies and researchers to come up with much more potent uh, antivirals against these variants to completely eliminate them. If we can't do that, uh, we're stuck in this pandemic. We're not going to get out of it. Okay, let's talk uh, a little bit more about the distribution of vaccines. Currently, the G20 countries have achieved 60% vaccination, while disproportionately, the low-income and developing countries are at 4%. So what's your take on the disproportional distribution of vaccine and how this is affecting our chances of returning to normalcy? So from the start, it was a really bad start because there was this protectionism that these developed rich countries wanted to vaccinate their people first. Second problem in the start was the availability of vaccines because a lot of these companies had supply chain issues to, prov to produce the vaccines and to distribute the vaccines. And I think that fundamental problem is to do with an organization called WHO, the World Health Organization. It has really poor leadership that it's their responsibility to work hard and if they can't achieve the goals of uh, an equitable distribution of these vaccines, they should have raised the alarm and they should have cried. And they did not, the same as they did with the start of the pandemic. And I think the consequence of that now, it's too late in the game. All this vaccine distribution and production could have been done jointly between many countries in the world. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. And I think this is the consequence of why we are seeing more of people who are anti-vaccines. We are seeing more of uh, infections that do not stop because we cannot vaccinate everyone. The reality is we could have done all that. And what we let, we let countries such as the United States, to some extent England, and some European countries, China, Russia, dominate the demand and supply of these vaccines while they sign these lucrative agreements with companies. It's really sad uh, to see that when we, or the whole world is on, on the same sinking ship, and then you still have countries who are in the ship that's going to sink, uh, becoming selfish in that sort of distribution where even in their own countries, they had to throw away doses of vaccines because they couldn't use them and they were coming to their expiry date. If we can't do this properly and treat human beings are human beings, it really shows that there is this disproportionate world we live in. Uh, we, we may be on the same planet, but we are in a completely different world and it's really sad. Now let's talk about um, new antiviral drugs. So we're hearing um, about these pills that could soon be the first effective oral treatments for COVID-19. Do you think they could be a game changer uh, for COVID-19 treatment? I am very excited about uh, uh, the two new drugs, Molipiravir from Merck, Paxlovid from Pfizer. Uh, very excited about them. I think uh, people need to, to understand so there's not going to be a lot of confusion as we had with the vaccines that they are new and they were discovered in six months and people are worried about that. These are very old molecules. These are not new molecules at all. Uh, the molecule from Pfizer was actually discovered uh, in 2001-2002 uh, during the first SARS-CoV pandemic. So it's over 20 years old. 
the molecule from Merck is actually an old antiviral that was developed for another virus. And that one has been around now for over 20 years as well. But uh, there was no interest in development because there was no market to sell it to. And because now there is an interest and there is a need, I think these two companies uh, have pushed these two molecules through the development process to the to the clinical trials. And the results look to me very, very impressive. I think very impressive for the Pfizer molecule uh, because their data uh, is, is actually very good. Out of 1,200 people in the trial, uh, only eight people died uh, who were in the placebo group. Uh, so you can see that their efficacy is over 80%. It's around 87%. The second nice thing about this pill, because by nature, we humans, we don't like to take pills. Uh, is really a treatment for three days. So if you feel that you have COVID, you don't need to go to to, to a hospital. Uh, I think you can call your doctor, pick up a prescription and take a treatment of this uh, for three days and you'll be fine. Uh, for the molecule or the drug from Merck, uh, its efficacy is 50%. These are all wonderful news. These are all great news. Uh, uh, the first problem, which is going to shock a lot of people, is going to be the cost of these drugs. Uh, Merck have already given an idea of $700. Uh, there are several speculators who think the Pfizer drug would be between two and $3,000 treatment. So the first question, who's going to afford it? It means if the governments are not going to buy it and make it available to people at a loss, at a discounted or a free, uh, not many people can afford that. Second, we're going to be in the same problem as the vaccines, distribution to the poor countries. And can they afford this or not? You know, vaccines were at $20, $25, perhaps less, now we are at 700 and that's a huge difference of cost and that actually worries me a lot how this is going to play out once they get approvals and they start marketing these drugs these drugs if they are priced correctly if there is really a push to provide them equitably around the world and start killing the virus slowly I think, for me, by the end of 2022, the beginning of 2023, we start seeing the world getting back to a new normal. If we don't do that, I think every three to four months, we're going to see a cycle, what people call a new wave. I just call it a cycle of a virus. And I think we have this pandemic becoming very political. We have some multinational companies that saw an opportunity to make a huge margins, huge profits. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a tough thing to balance. I just hope that uh, at least the leaders of the G20 have suffered enough to understand that there is a way out and they have to coordinate their efforts, you know, to bring the rest of the world and the rest of the governments with them to actually get us at least out to a new norm that's going to be much more stable, where we are free to travel, we are free to do things. So those were all the questions we had for you today. And uh, it was a very informative session. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today.